And I'm going to assume that even if you didn't see the presentation, everybody here is more or less familiar with what happened on June 24th, 2021, right? Where the Champlain Towers uh, collapses, at least the eastern portion of that, 98 people died. Um, and and the, these are the mistakes that appear to have contributed to that. Inequality, inadequate design of the pool deck in accordance with the original design code, which was 1971. Uh, especially with respect to punch and shoot. Uh, excess weight, um, it's not clear that the concrete overlay was included in the original design. Uh, the, the, the deficiencies in that design would suggest it was not. The addition of pavers uh, and, and larger planters than intended. Um, that, that combined with shallow top reinforcement, um, which decreases the effective depth, and, 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 and we'll get into this, but punch and shear strength is, uh, assumed to be proportional to the effective depth of reinforcing. And, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention also the engineers responsible for the recertification um, also failed to identify the deficiency, although there were warning signs and the deficiency was in part identified in their own calculations. Um, other contributing causes uh, are long-term sustained load effects. We had a little bit of a discussion in the last uh, after the presentation about that, um, normally not an issue because dead load issues are kind of masked by the fact that we design structures for a combination of dead and live load with a larger load factor on the live load. So the so, uh, a dead load deficiency per se doesn't matter, but when you think about these slabs collapsing without the absence of live load, then the sustained or long-term effects become important. Um, the low top reinforcement ratio, and I have a slide on that. By this, is, is not that reinforcement itself was low, but the amount of reinforcement um, uh, does not meet current code requirements, which requires more of a concentration of reinforcement around the column. And in fact, uh, ACI in its current code cycle is considering even stronger provisions for concentration of reinforcement in the immediate vicinity of columns. We'll talk about that. Um, water buildup from the planters may have contributed. Uh, There's a good question on that. And, and corrosion, it's a bit of an unknown. We didn't see it in the primary evidence facility. The chloride contents weren't especially high, but it's uh, not all the evidence that we would like to have seen was in the primary evidence facility, right? And there was evidence of corrosion kind of elsewhere in the site and so on. So, um, but uh, again, not much indication of corrosion from what we could see, right? So these are a few more slides I prepared to get this discussion going. Um, and first that this was designed in accordance to 1979 South Florida Building Code, uh, which references the 1977 edition of ACI 318. Um, and in that edition, uh, punching shear is uh, given by the equation shown in the third bullet point for roots of F prime sub C times B naught D. So F prime sub C is the concrete compressive strength, the square root of that. B naught is a perimeter. There's a perimeter. Um, and, and D is the effective depth of that reinforcement. So remember I talked about the reinforcement being lower than it's supposed to be. And if it gets lower, then that D factor decreases. And if it's low by an inch and you're only dealing with seven inches of effective depth in the first place, that's not an insignificant loss of uh, potential strength. Um, but what I want to talk about a little bit more was uh, um, this equation um, is generally kind of considered almost independently of what's going on with respect to flexure. Um, and for those of you who are structural engineers know that in, in beams, um, shear and flexure interact, right? And the, the, uh, the shear strength can be dependent on the, the uh, amount of moment and the, particularly the reinforcement strain. So the same is true of punching shear. But for design convenience, we kind of think of them independently, perhaps too independently, because if you have a serious flexural problem, that exacerbates the 
country problem. And, and uh, there's a, a researcher named a professor named Bhutani who's looked into this a lot and, and they calculate that you have to have enough reinforcement to uh, avoid what he calls a flexurally driven, driven punching shear, where you get a yield line form, formation around the column due to excessive um, uh, flexural stresses and eventually uh, uh, punching. And, and the reinforcement ratios in this case, partly due to the design mistakes and, and, and the fact that we use the 77 code, uh, were sufficiently low that that this flexurally driven punching shear failure was the possibility. And, and four roots of F prime sub C was not, it was too high, right? Um, the, 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 our back calculations following procedures recommended by Mutani suggested that if you if back calculates them more like three roots of F prime sub C, but you have to go through and calculate the flexural strength and analyze the possibility of the formation of these, these uh, flexural cracks. Um, I, um, the current code committee, I've been on uh, the ACI 318 committee for more than 25 years and, and for a longer time than that, I've been on ACI's committee on, on, um, on shear and torsion. And, and a large part of that has been the focus on, on punching shear. Um, in the current edition of code, the 25 edition of the code, um, language was added, and I could show you in the slabs cap that it says you have to concentrate reinforcement around the column at a certain minimum. Um, and for the next code cycle, that's for the 19th, that's, I say 25, for the 318-19 cycle. We're currently working on the 318-25 code, and there's going to, looking at another precision provision, which you see on the screen here, is that's this introduction of this term K sub P. <coughs> K sub P is intended to uh, reflect the influence of the reinforcement ratio. Uh, it's essentially a backhanded way of getting into flexural strength. Then that would come into all of those equations and the, uh, the K, K sub P factor is a function of Rho, which is the flexural reinforcement ratio to the one third power, um, less than or equal to one, but it can't be less than 0.5. So you can never have less than two roots of F prime sub C strength. Uh, uh, and, and four is still the maximum, but you, if you have low reinforcement ratios, you could find that this case of P might be 0.7 or 0.8. Um, you know, based on our calculations at, at uh, Champlain Towers, it should be about. 0.75, which would get you back to three roots of F prime sub C. Okay. Um, so that, uh, don't tell anybody you heard this from me. I probably shouldn't be talking about provisions that are still under consideration, but um, I, I, I think as a professional, you should know we're looking at this, right? Because right now, uh, you know, we talk about what, what we did as part of the civil litigation. Um, NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, is carrying out an investigation of this collapse. And they were on the site quite early, um, and, but they have you know, like a four or five year plan to do the investigation. Um, and the point is that they'll be examining this quite closely and they'll make certain recommendations. Um, and I'm sure they're going to focus in on, on punching shear and punching shear design provisions, including these kinds of provisions. So as an industry, we're, it, it's good that we, in for 2019, uh, tightened up the requirements for concentration of reinforcement in the vicinity of the columns. This 2025 uh, code change, if approved, will continue to do the same thing. And, and so, uh, you know, I guess that's a good thing. That it, you know, it, at least ACI can say you know, we're out ahead of this. We're aware of the issue, and 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 remember also that um, this design was deficient relative to the 1977 code. So, um, but one of the things that's happened in the industry when 
when this was designed. Is anybody familiar with the equivalent frame method and the direct design method in the code? Okay, I get a few nods here, but that required a certain amount of reinforcement in a column strip and a certain amount of reinforcement in the middle strip. That's really not in the code anymore. It's been replaced by these requirements for concentration of, of, of reinforcement. And, and a lot of these slabs are designed using software and the software no longer rec recognizes middle strips and column strips. So it's again, more important than ever, we don't ignore this effect of um, the reinforcement ratio and the vicinity of, of columns. Had there been some changes after 77 to, to make it, to, to address this, or are we skipping almost from 77 to 2019? Uh, not nothing that I significant between 77 and 2019. Uh, like, I don't know which addition is that we dropped the direct design method because so many uh, engineers were using computers, right? And then they would get right off the computer printout how much uh, uh, flexural reinforcement and they needed and, and what the thickness had to be for shear or check shear, but the but but the two were never really combined too much, right? That, and I'm not sure there's a general awareness that, of the interaction between flexure and shear. So um, uh, the, the answer to your question is not a lot between 77 and 2019. Um, I wanted to show you this, and this is a little bit hard to, to uh, see what's going on, but it's, it's, it's uh, it's a plot of stress ratio versus concrete strain that shows a failure number. Okay. So as you um, and and they show the curves for various durations starting from uh, 20 minutes all the way to infinity. And, and essentially what you're looking at is a decrease in the effective strain with time that follows this curve. And that's what I talked about when I mentioned sustained float effects. So now when we were assessing existing structures or even designing new structures, we sort of this interaction, uh, um, you know, the size functions we are concerned. We have the four roots of F prime from C equation, but in the background is bending moment makes a difference, right? And, and the amount of reinforcement that you have makes a difference. and if you have a structure under sustained load, imagine a, a flat <clears throat> slab or a flat plate um, that serves as the roof level of an underground parking structure with three feet of earth on top of it, that earth would be considered uh, a dead load. So, and, and the required lab load might be quite small. So most of your demand is, is dead load. So that's where this factor, um, can come into play. Um, I've been rambling a little bit, and I don't know that I have oh, one other slide. Um, you know, one of the things when we completed our investigation, we presented uh, to our clients uh, kind of what we thought should happen by way of follow up. Okay, and um, and one is to study the effects of sustained load. Right, I don't think this is understood as well as it should be. Um, and in de determined to, to pin down the cause of the collapse, uh, we recommended full-scale experimental testing um, of, of the uh, uh, punching of uh, replicas, if you will, which you build the column in a section of the slab and, and, and load it subjected to punching. Um, and also we were very interested in uh, the, that connection at beam A, uh, and we talked about how that triggered the collapse of the building. Um, and I'm happy to report that, that NIST and, and through their National Construction Safety Team, this government investigation, which is gonna take years and years, has put out a RFP to do these things. And, and, and it aligns perfectly with what we thought should happen. Um, and in fact, we're on one of the teams that's submitting a proposal and they haven't selected who's gonna to get to do this testing as yet. But, but they will include punching shear replicas as well as uh, replicas of that beam column connection because um, that's a, 
uh, also a very important question. Uh, and that is, how does, you know, a Punchinger failure in a pool deck above a parking area result in the collapse of a 12 story tower and the death of 98 people? Yes, uh, thanks for this program. It's very good. I don't know if this is hearing, but are you saying the government's already issued their report? No, they have not issued their report. And the question was, uh, on the government investigation by NIST and the National Construction Safety Team, uh, have they issued their report? And the answer is uh, no, it'll probably it's probably at least two years away. And what they did issue is a request for proposal to do the kinds of studies that are listed here on the screen to do full-size replica testing, if you will. Did so, they issue any kind of interim report from just a of the kind of stuff that the different consultants would do, or will they not do anything until they've done the additional research? Uh, they provide uh, reports. I'm actually on the, um, and have been for years, the advisory committee to the National Construction Safety Team. And so I, I sit in on their meetings and they report to us, and then we in turn write a re letter to Congress about how they're doing, including mm -hmm. what we think of their investigation of Champlain Towers, uh, south, and that's all very public. But um, as you might imagine, they don't issue interim reports um, until they're certain of things. Um, and, and for example, Doug, we were very frustrated about the specimens in the primary evidence facility that we get to this warehouse full of specimens and they said, well, good luck with that. that they were identified by number, but there was no cross-reference between where they actually came from and the real structure. So it was a bit of a nightmare to try to, you know, you could tell, you know, by some columns we knew because there was parking uh, stall numbers on the columns. Uh, and, and then we got a key to figure all that out. But beyond that, we were kind of on our own and we had to kind of surmise from the appearance of the specimen, where generally they came from the building. But when it came to, for example, I showed that one punching shear uh, specimen of a slab, we don't know exactly which column that was from. So uh, it, it, the point is, I'm getting off on a tangent, is that they're reluctant. And the reason they said they didn't do that is because they weren't certain of the location. They, they said, we kind of know where these are from, but because we're not certain, we're not going to tell you. So, so you're not in your own. Surely, you know, the A and E's involved in this project aren't liable for anything because it's been past uh, time. But, you know, in the same uh, sentence, you really show they it failed in design. And so, is there any kind of. Yeah, so the, the firm, the question was. The, you know, the architects and engineers involved in your original design, uh, you know, do they have any liability? And it's been 40 years and, and that's passed the statute of limitations uh, generally. And I don't know what the law is in Florida, um, but in Illinois, for example, the statute doesn't even begin to run until the problem is discovered. So and in other states, it's, it would go back to the date of the original design. But the argument is the problem wasn't discovered until 2021. Um, but Nevertheless, there really was no recourse certainly in the civil litigation because the firm no longer existed. The, the principals had all died. Uh, same with the construction company. There may still be some surviving uh, engineers who worked on it, but but I don't think they would have any real. Um, well, is the firm still? Is the firm still open? It's not. They not, have. It's not still open. And the, the structural engineering firm, or the you know, neither the architect nor the structural engineering firm. Are still open. Did you say in a meeting a while ago that there was a settlement a while back? And that was your report part of that settlement? Yes. Yeah, so our findings were part of that settlement. The question was, was there a settlement? And and as I reported uh, uh, in response to a question of, uh, in the previous presentation, the civil litigation settled. So this is an interesting dynamic. I appreciate your questions and thoughts about this. Um, the civil litigation proceeds separately from the government investigation. Um, the National Construction Safety Team and NIST operate a little bit like the NTSB. The only difference is um, 
the National Construction Safety Team, they pick and choose the events that they investigate. And, and this one, you know, rang all the bells. It was clear that the government needed to follow up on this. It was the most significant collapse since the Hyatt. Um, or the, they investigated, of course, the 9 11 events and so on. So they were going to do it, but they, uh, uh, um, and they have certain rights to um, evidence and the site and so on that the experts for the civil litigation don't have. But if you think about it, the parties to that litigation, especially the plaintiffs, uh, you know, have a very legitimate interest in seeing justice done and, and justice done based on the, uh, uh, the truth and the actual evidence, and which is kind of there. In the meanwhile, the government's kind of hiding the ball. And, and one of the best things that came out of this uh, is that, you know, there's loss of the fact that, that, that uh, the National Construction Safety Team has subpoena power and they have control of the site. And, and, and if you're somebody else, you're nobody. Um, but the lawyers we work for um, looked into that matter. And they looked into the hearings that um, led to the formation of the National Construction Safety Team. And, and, and the National Construction Safety Team Act is, is a matter of public record. It, it bestows all those rights on the, uh, the government to investigate these things and their, their subpoena power and all that kind of thing. But as this was being formed, one person asked a question, um, do you intend to interfere with civil litigation? And that's not part of the act per se, um, but that question arose. And then that, the question was on the record that was um, whatever it was, 20 years old, and since the formation of this National Construction Safety Team. So our attorneys brought to the, at the attention of NIST because the, the response was from NIST, no, we would never want to interfere with civil litigation. And, and our attorneys representing plaintiffs and defendants says, well, you kind of are uh, um, by, by, by not sharing what you learned. So, um, you know, I know this because I'm on their advisory committee, based on that, uh, and to their credit, the National Construction Safety Team and NIST took it upon themselves to amend the act, say that they won't interfere with civil litigation, that they'll share information, and so, um, so good and, came out of it. So good came out. Of so some good came out, and 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 it's in the interest of justice, you know, because really NIST's interest and in, and in, in, in is a um, admirable, noble interest, and that is we need to learn from these things, and and they're going to issue a report making recommendations on things like punching shear and, and and how we should change as an industry. The industry they're certainly going to address recertifications and how that happens and inspections, all those kinds of things. Similar things came out of the 9-11 event, right? And going back out of the Hyatt event. But um, that's one good that comes out of these, but it's not the only good. The other good, the other good is justice for the involved parties, right? And, that, and so I think with this change, um, that will be more likely to happen, right? The civil litigation can proceed. Um, I'm rambling here, but the, uh, I was involved in the investigative collapse of the FIU pedestrian bridge on behalf of the designers. And in that case, NTSB did the investigation. And NTSB's rights to the investigation, they're even stronger. I mean, they have total authority. I mean, the only thing, they can subpoena anybody, uh, but you can't say anything. And, and, and civil litigation has no rights like whatsoever under NTSB, and we were part of the civil litigation, and we wanted just some basic facts, the things, the evidence that they're taking for the purpose of their investigation were not available to uh, civil litigation. So you're kind of investigating half in the dark, right? And, and they do issue, in the case of NTSB, interim factual reports, they call them, which help us. Um, but the point is, that's an area that needs work on the transportation side, right? Um, which includes not just structures, but, but even primarily aircrafts and, 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 and train accidents and so right. on. In, the, in this case, were there, were there other reports made or just your report on the civil 
settlement for you, whatever that was. Yeah, so we didn't really issue one. We didn't issue a report per se. Uh, what we did was issue our findings to our client. Meanwhile, there's other experts. There's experts from the plaintiff. There's experts uh, uh, for other defendants, the owners of the building to the south, the, the, the security company, and so on. They're all we're all there together. There must have been 20 or 30 different experts, but none of the attorneys want you to write it down. So the presentation you saw today, the basis of that was frankly the presentation we gave to our client. And similar, I'm sure other experts gave similar presentations to theirs. Do they all pretty much agree or there were different opinions of why? Well, others have not been as forthcoming as we have in sharing our findings. I hope they uh, do. Uh, but uh, then, how should I put this? There's a lot of emphasis in, in, in uh, geotechnical issues and that vibration claim of the building to the south and so on. There's a lot of plaintiffs that were more interested in that than could. So you, you mentioned when you're showing the plans that planters were either not installed or originally designed or they were additional plans. So who includes that and do they take into account the design? Yeah, so the question was, um, uh, the planters, there's inconsistencies between what was shown on the plans and what was finally built. And the same is true of the overlay, right? Both of those things influence the load for the, for which uh, you design. And bear in mind the plans, and it's fortunate we had them, they were kept by the city of Surfside as a set of plans that were submitted to them for permit. And those of you who are familiar with construction will know that, you know, the design team will submit a set of plans for permit kind of before they're fully cooked, <laughs> right? Because they want to get the permit process going. And, and I, I think there was no exception here. And then they work out some of the final loose ends and details, which you know, may have involved shifting the planter locations, probably involved this overlay. And they built it off the, some set of plans that we don't have. And there was no as built that was available to us. Uh, like they would be normal in any more modern construction. Um, so uh, I can't answer your question because if, if our speculation is if, if they built it that way, that they would have, the whole design team had to know. Uh, but the question is, did they do anything about it? They just, oh, that's not going to matter very much. Who cares about a few issues of extra concrete, those kind of things? Or did they go back and redo the calculations? So on, and, um, because we don't have the original calculations, no original construction files, those we may not have to. If there would have been no pavers or waterproofing or anything like that on top of this pool deck, but let's just say it was concrete, would the distress have been obvious around the columns? Um, <laughs> And, and, and the reason no one saw it is because it's just covered up with all these yeah. images. Well, they had the perfect, okay, great question, Doug. Uh, the question was, would the, the stress have been visible absent uh, if, it, if it was just concrete? And, and what they showed on the plans per se was, was, was the concrete plus a, a layer of, of rigid tile. Um, and, and, and the answer in that case was yes, you'd see cracking, flexible cracking, punching cracks and that kind of rigid material. But what was there for the last 20 years anyway, was um, on top of that, a layer of sand. And I wasn't as clear as I should have been in the original presentation on top of pavers, they put a layer of sand on top of it, uh, and then pavers. So that's a perfect system. If you want to disguise cracks, <laughs> just put a layer of waterproofing, then a layer of sand and a layer of brick uh, pavers. That, which you can't really tell cracks. And even brick pavers that you can clean up every five years if you need to reset them. So he says, gosh, these darn things keep moving. So that that you know raises questions around, you know, what good is an inspection in some cases, right? When in, in the case of the building itself, now then the pavers potentially had the same punching issues on various floors. Um, but what's unique about the pool deck, it's only one floor. So you have very, very small columns and very heavy loads, whereas floor to floor wasn't so much. But even in a typical building, 
It's going to be covered up by carpeting and tiles and other things that the skies will find. Right. You had a question. Yes, my observation of your initial presentation and what you're saying here makes me to believe that the sign program did not have a role in the inspection. Yeah, so the question was the presentation would suggest that the design firm didn't have a strong role in construction observation and inspection. And I'd be inclined to agree with you. Um, and uh, but that's a matter for speculation. There are no construction records. Uh, um, yeah. Now, this may go back, they have subpoena power, they may go back and try to answer. In other words, find out you know who sur what surviving members of the construction team there are, and interview them about who had what role in you know original construction. I was around forty years ago, so I, uh, my memory's not that good, but <laughs> you never know. You mentioned Jed Hagenbaum. Was there some sort of foundation there? There was none, and I, I went I went through it kind of quickly. But I remember the slide I showed, and, and uh, I'll come back to it. Um, the question was about foundation failures, and and from early on, Matt and I uh, were were very interested in that, right? So because the foundation failure could easily cause something like this, right? Um, so which is why when we first had access to the site in October 2021, we said we need to get a surveyor out there and and take these measurements of. The elevation of the basement slabs. This is the parking level at the very lowest level. So, if there was a major foundation failure, right, um, you would see depressions or something in this slab. And because this is a slab, the level at which supported the building above, and it's exhibiting virtually zero movement, right? There's only one or two inches difference in, in the area in question. Some of these. Uh, more severe concrete had to do with uh, sumps and drainage in the corner of the structure, but the basic slab was flat. Um, and, and so early on, we just didn't see a compelling reason to follow up, you know, on, on the foundation issue because it was just not evidenced by the, by the slab. I don't know if you agree with that or not. I mean, we'll we learn that that reasoning is flawed, but um, the other parties have a great deal of interest in, in foundation and still is, I think, but uh, I don't, I don't get it. Uh, we just don't see it here in this elevation survey. And remember this, uh, this flat, despite the fact that we supported the building, the whole building collapsed down that much. And then it was all removed. <laughs> it's still well, was that, was that a pier foundation or was it a spread building or something like this? So the question is, what's its foundation type? I'll come to your question in a second. Um, so I'll show you, I hope. I know we're going all over, off topic and all over the place, but I think you, you guys have very good questions. I forgot we had this quite this many slides. I'm maybe a little far behind, but this is one building gets torn down as part of all of the recovery. Um, let me finish this question. So the answer was, they use these Frankie pockets, which are, and I can't find this slide of them. Essentially, they, they, they take a sleeve, they put aggregate and, and, a, and cement in the sleeve and they pound the sleeve and this aggregate together down. And, and then they stop at a certain level and they continue to pound this stuff until the aggregate and cement spread out in a ball below the um, sleeve, and then they withdraw the sleeve. So you end up with this kind of, it, it does two things. It creates kind of a piling with a ball on the bottom, which is good. And it also compacts the soil in the vicinity. Uh, and that's what they use. And they were only like 15 feet deep. 
should make sense to us because it, it wasn't like it was a distinct, it, it, this was all kind of a limestone formation, but very crumbly, soft, you know, it's more like sand and stuff. And that's, that's how they're able to construct these piers. Um, but uh, it was all interesting findings, but we don't see how that had anything to do with it. So there's no shift in the foundation? No, no shift is evidenced by the climbers. Were those piles supporting a, a map or they are independent or each column at the column? So the piles, there were piles at each top. And then, but there was also a structural slab at the, yeah. level, at the lowest level. And, and that's a slab that was surveyed here, and I've lost that now, but uh, it was slab. Yes, yes, so I want to get back to the hearing noises that go the night that it started failing. Now, I'm thinking that maybe those noises might have started before that. Is there any record of any building creaking noises where you hear weird things in the night and you don't know what they are before this, before the day that they have to collapse? Well, some, and, and I, and I, in the interest of time, I had a half hour before. Um, I didn't cover that in, in the kind of detail I should have, but there was, um, but not much. Uh, there was the, um, it was this event. Um, where these planters showed distress about three weeks before. And, and that would have made some noise, but I don't think there was any reports about that noise. So that's three weeks before. Um, but then this is kind of all we could piece on the day of the collapse. And now beginning at 1230, so this is 40 minutes before the pool deck collapse, uh, a resident in 111, and 111 is right on the pool deck level, that would have been right outside their units, reported, quote, construction noises coming from the garage. Now that could have been the beginnings of this failure, but then it was um, 110 to 115 where they, they pulled that collapse. Now that, that made some noise, right? And it was observed by the uh, people in the unit to the uh, north and so on. You know, the first one was three weeks before the collapse and might have gotten progressively worse. Yeah, I don't know if you, the question was, yeah, would there have been noises before that? I don't know if you've ever observed structural testing. I have the opportunity to do, do a fair amount of structural testing to failure. And, and there's always that, that period when you're at 95% to the final load where the structure that you're testing complains, right? It cracks badly, it starts making noise, and flakes of concrete begin to fall off, those kinds of things. Um, and sometimes that's used as a monitoring method, right? They would listen for noises and cracks and things. Oh, I think that about the North Tower. Oh. Did they tear down the North Tower for the investigation? No, they didn't. So that is, that's a good question. The Champlain Tower South, there's also Champlain Towers North. Um, we still exist, and it was basically a sister building, uh, and very similar but not identical floor plan. And when we gave our findings to our client, again to their credit, they said, you, "You've got to say something to the city of Surfside about what you found here, because they have a very similar building in, in Champlain Towers North, and there was another." That was kind of a sister building and a cousin building built by the same developer. They had the same structural system as well. So we had a conversation with the city of Surfside and their engineer, named Alan Kilsheimer, who was also part of the civil litigation uh, on behalf of Surfside. So he was aware of generally what was going on. And we shared our findings, he shared theirs, but assured us that they were well aware that it was a punch and shear failure. They were well, the, well aware of the contributing causes. They checked check the design and it was not identical. The span layout was just enough different. Anyway, they did, according to Alan, they didn't have the problems at Champlain Towers North that they had at Champlain Towers South. I think there's since been some strengthening or shoring installed, um, make everybody feel more comfortable, but mm -hmm. that building survives and will continue to survive. You have a question. I was wondering on the I 
Uh, I was wondering if the analysis done um, according to the plan that was actually submitted to the city and if that had different results to um, the establishment of the country uh, and if this is basic and the uh, cost of that, it's just really hard to compare it. Well, yeah, so the question was, what about the original design? Was that in accordance with uh, what we observed at the site or, or just what was on the plan submitted for construction? And, and that's, we don't know the answer to that question. Again, maybe this will eventually uh, talk to people who know the answer to that question. Um, I think there's a good chance because the design was so deficient that they didn't, for example, include that extra top of weight. Um, but that's speculation. They, they could have just made a mistake otherwise, but it was a pretty, it was, it was the major contributing cause was design that did not meet the 1977 code. Everything I've said about low reinforcing steel, sustained load, and all those other, are, they're all important factors, but you start out with the design that was deficient by um, you know, 30 or 40%, you know, compared to what you you mentioned several times that a civil litigation is there also a criminal litigation? Uh, no. Uh, the question was, is there also a criminal uh, litigation uh, or criminal proceedings, right? Uh, and the, the, the only thing I would say about that is that um, uh, the police originally kind of took control because they considered it a crime scene. And they wouldn't even let NIST did the government on site because they said this is a crime scene, but there's never been a, uh, any kind of arrest or, or criminal warrant or whatever that process is. But they, they uh, in fact, they had a lot to do with how things were stored in the primary evidence facility. And, and that's an area that, um, well, just from our point of view, the police were too heavy handed, too restrictive, they should have trusted both the government and us to do the right thing towards investigating this. It's not right for police to speculate on what causes a collapse, right? They could be looking into other things surrounding it and uh, documents and so on. But um, it, if we want to learn from these things and we want to properly settle things in, this, in, in civil court, uh, you don't want the police kind of obstructing the process. And then, in fact, Matt Fanner, in the early days, my partner, who was supposed to be here today, went to the site like three days after. And, and he just asked them, hey, is there any chance, you know, I can um, uh, look around from over here or there? I want to interfere with anything you're doing. So on a very polite, professional question, he was almost arrested. He said, what are you doing here? You have no business on this site. And, you know, I guess... In the police's defense, when this thing happened, there was a lot of ordinance, <laughs> just busy bodies, everything else, and they had to deal with that's the nature of these things. Uh, but uh, uh, it was, uh, the police were pretty, pretty heavy handed. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Of course, USC would not have been part of the design of this building two many years ago, but USC. Speculating 
likely with because the problem is you've got 50 floors above, and they all had sufficient catenary forces and catenary capacities, they could have arrested the, the rest of the class. Not only that, UFC provides for uh, high force detailing requirements, and you know, especially in slab. And then you need to get a lot of capacity in that. I'm guessing, my question is, would you look into that? I think there's no, this is a progressive collapse analysis that you guys have not done. Yeah, so we didn't look at it, you know, in a finding per se, NIST will. And, and, and I know it's going to come back to ACI 318 about progressive collapse. So two comments. There's, there's, there's cantonary reinforcement in a two-way slab. The idea is if you get a punch and kill your failure, then it's it, it, it's arrested. It doesn't collapse right away, right? That the, the bottom bars going through the core of the column are sufficient to support uh, the cantonary. Um, change uh, provisions to that effect is being considered right now in this code cycle by ACI 318. That's good. Um, and and there's, we've always had the requirement of at least two bars pass through the column core at least for the last 20 years. But I don't think we had it in 1977, and nor did they, the disk construction meet it. And had they had even that, it might have prevented the, the uh, pool deck punching failures from progressing to, from column to column. But they did. Um, but then the other side of that question is, is how did it progress to the building per se? And, and a lot of the speculation online is things like, well, there should have been some kind of uh, fuse, right? That there been an expansion joint or something between the pool deck and the building that wouldn't have allowed it to progress into the building. And um, but there wasn't. And, uh, that's critical column punching shift. That was was that a perimeter column or was that an interior column? Interior column. If there was sufficient high force detailing, I would think that that in the slide at that time had the potential ability to address that. Yeah, oh, yeah. If they had that kind of tie, when you say tie reinforcement, you're talking about reinforcement goes over the column core, right? From well, column to column. Uh, I'm talking, well, the problem there is that uh, the punching shear the likelihood of damage that they're enforcing enough is not going to be, it's not going to hold. And you're going to have a failure of, of the continuous reinforcement you have to do, which probably is the same. But the, but the slab reinforcement, if, if you follow the UFC design criteria uh, and you have continuous. Uh, Tacos reinforcing the slab, that can give a lot of capacity for the rest of the lab. Is that crazy? So they talk about tire reinforcement, it goes from column to column. Is that reinforcement under that UFC criteria required to be uh, mechanically uh, spliced, or can you have lab spliced? Yeah, it, uh, I think you can splice it. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's okay to do reinforcement splicing. And, and um, yes, you can do it through the beams. It's potent, the potential is there for the, the reinforcement and beams to provide that catenary capacity. But the slab itself, even if you lose what happens around the columns and beams, the slab itself has a lot of potential capacity. And UFC requires detailing to keep it continuous and have a sufficient amount of reinforcement, which might have, might have been enough. To prevent this, if it's continuous, if it's not continuous, then you've got to Right. Well, I, we are talking about just the slab. That's what I would at least start I with. The second, the second. Well, yeah, the beam it was a special detail because of the step. But remember, the, all these punching shear failures of the pool deck were all flat slab, no beams, and, and just pure punching failures. And, and those punching failures can be resisted with, you're calling it tie reinforcement or cantonary reinforcement. And, and it's they're pretty easy actually to calculate how much is required, but the key is that that reinforcement has to run through the column core. Doesn't do any good if it's away from the column core. That's that's one method. That, that's one cause of action that might not work. But even if you totally lose the column, if you've got reinforcement around it, top force reinforcement around it, it provides a lot of a lot of capacity. Even the slab itself is acting with the top forces. Uh, can have that. Well, yeah, perhaps. Okay, I think I see what you're saying now. 
But if you have that kind of catenary and it spans especially multiple bays, remember it has to be anchored somewhere. And, and, and the connection at the perimeter wall would, no matter how much tie reinforcement you have, is nowhere near it. It just pulled off that wall in a heartbeat. And, and it would be hard to imagine you'd have to have reinforced abutments or something <laughs> to, to make that happen. Maybe we're getting a little far afield. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. We do on time. I think we're we're close to there. All right. Well, let's give a big round of applause.